Principles of Non-Union Management. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series, Version 5. Slides are by Dr. Spence Reed with Dr. Henry Boateng and Amsakib Rahman narrating. And this is our second video from the slide deck. In the first video, we already covered basic principles of non-unions, why non-unions occur, uh, how you should work them up. Uh, and we also talked a lot about um, mechanical environment and strain and strain theory and especially shear strain uh, and why that's important. Uh, and we kind of finished talking about analyzing your non-union. So I'm not going to go through these step by step, but I did want to start off this video by recapitulating um, this uh, assessment. And uh, let's now get into um, some cases. So here's a 32-year-old healthy male with a closed fracture of the distal tibia shaft extending to the metadiaphyseal region, as you can see on these AP and lateral images. A uh, patient was initially treated in preliminary external fixation, and then you can see was then treated using minimally invasive plate, uh, percutaneous plate osteosynthesis with a four centimeter uh, distal incision. Um, so presumably this area is not exposed or compressed. So think about what is the strain here, going back to our last video. Um, is this a bridge plate? What do you think is going to happen here? Uh, and again, this is a lecture on non-union, so uh, I think you know what's going to happen. So at three months, you can see there's good callus formation, right, along that uh, lateral cortex. Um, so here you can see uh, the biology is there. It's uh, certainly trying to stabilize, trying to heal, but you still have this persistent uh, lucency coming across uh, the fracture site. So uh, eventually at eight months, the um, uh, race to union um, is uh, in favor of the non-union and the plate eventually will fail mechanically. And uh, you can see there's a small crack in the plate there. And you really have to sometimes look very carefully for these because it's often not a catastrophic, um, you know, sudden deformity and a snap and uh, the person's leg is suddenly unstable. So make sure you do look for, um, I mean, it shouldn't be that difficult to see, uh, but uh, sometimes it can be, it be, it can be slightly subtle. So why did it fail? Well, uh, you can argue the strain was very high because of a small gap and no compression. Uh, you, we talked about this callus, uh, attempted to try and control this motion and strain, and the fatigue life of the plate eventually was exceeded. So uh, shear strain can be controlled with lag screw and uh, compression. So you can see this is revised to a somewhat longer uh, plate. Uh, you can see that... Um, a screw was placed across the non-union uh, to attempt to compress this, and that helped to control the mechanical environment. Here's another case, 71-year-old uh, insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, severe venous stasis disease, uh, was treated non-surgically in a cast. Um, so it's sort of a steep angle non-union. Uh, you're going to worry a lot about strain. Uh, we, we showed this in the uh, uh, previous video. There's a translational strain going on here. And um, uh, unfortunately, it's difficult to plate. You have bad soft tissue. Uh, so what are your options? So in this particular case, a decision is made to uh, proceed with uh, correction, slow correction, in a ring external fixator over 21 days, and uh, then compressed. And you can see this is using a hexapod-type device with um, computer program to uh, determine the... Um, um, basically how to motor the um, uh, frame back into position to, for correction. And then uh, this is changed to a walking cast, sorry for the typo there, um, and uh, the frame was in place for six months. And you can see that, you know, by deformity correction and compression, we can get this thing to heal. Here's another case, 35-year-old uh, male, healthy motorcycle uh, accident, um, type 3A open femur, proximal tibia with extensor mechanism injury, open pilon fracture, uh, and uh, that patient was initially treated. I'll go back for a second. You can see an external fixation and some preliminary screw fixation of the femoral neck. Then goes back for open reduction, internal fixation of the femoral neck, retrograde femoral nailing. 
Uh, you can see a sliding hip screw device also being used and probably, probably maybe linked there or perhaps the screws behind the device. But nevertheless, um, the um, ring fixator is um, extended across the knee to protect your extensor mechanism repair. We talked about you know that as being one of the injuries. 18 months later, the patient still has pain with ambulation. Um, the patient has 0 to 110 degrees range of motion of the knee. No infection has been diagnosed. The femoral neck's actually healed. But you can see the uh, diaphyseal nonunion of your open femoral shaft fracture. So well aligned, um, presumably reasonably stabilized, but um, you know still did not go on to heal. So uh, this was treated with reamed exchange nailing of that retrograde femoral nail and then additional compression plating. So you can almost see like a wave plate type um, design here to accommodate around the uh, attempted callus formation and then compression with uh, no autogenous bone grafting, just used a um, demineralized bone matrix material. And four months later, uh, you can see a combination of the exchange nailing, which presumably may deliver some uh, autogenous uh, graft into the site um, in addition to, um, I don't know if the nail was upsized here also, but uh, certainly a lot of additional stability with that additional plate. Difficult to do when you have a nail in place, um, So, um, but as you can see, can be done. Here's another case, 55-year-old uh, non-union after an osteotomy, uh, and you can see there's some broken hardware here, so you have to do some deformity analysis, and... You know, consider in both planes, center of rotation angulation. In this case, the fracture was not even opened. Uh, this was treated with distraction again and deformity correction. And by doing that, the bone in that fracture gap undergoes metaplasia. Uh, the tissue in the fracture gap undergoes metaplasia into bone. And uh, uh, with that alignment corrected, the strain is controlled by the frame, and this goes on to heal. Another case, 44-year-old woman, 18-month status post-closed pilon fracture. Infection workup is negative. Um, so here you've got deformity. Um, perhaps you need to restore biology as well. You certainly need to stabilize this a little bit better also. So a lot of issues here to address. So you do your deformity analysis, and we won't go into that in detail here, but you find your center rotation angulation. And in this case you actually have to create an opening and a closing wedge as shown there. And um, here you can see there's also autograft going to be placed at your opening wedge and uh, plate fixation. And uh, two years later, um, takes a while, but eventually with deformity correction, bone grafting, this goes on to heal. Uh, still have some pain, but certainly an improvement from where that started. Okay, so we're going to pause here, and um, we will pick up talking about fracture gaps, bone loss. Uh, um, not too much about bone loss, but we'll get into uh, sort of distraction osteogenesis. We'll talk about infection uh, in the uh, next section. Thanks.